Okay, so we're going to get started again. For those who just joined, my name is Corey Diamond. I'm the uh, Executive Director of Efficiency Canada. Welcome to our weekly discovery session, uh, which we host every Friday at noon uh, Eastern. And um, uh, I'm really excited for today's session. Um, we have a, a really interesting initiative that we're going to be discussing called Full Disclosure is the name of the presentation. And it talks about um, a voluntary initiative that the Canada Green Building Council has pulled together to, to help commercial real estate uh, companies uh, disclose, disclose their energy usage in their large buildings. So not only do we have an expert talking about this, Levi Higgs, who's going to walk us through what they've learned from this initiative, but during our Q&A, we've actually invited um, three leaders from the um, commercial real estate sector who have been kind of leading the charge on this and, uh, and be willing to kind of talk to, to everyone in the audience around, um, you know, what they've learned during this process, what kinds of plans they have for the future. So today we've got Nikki Arthur from Colliers International. We have Jamie Gray Donald from Quadriel. And we have Joanna Jackson from Minto. So three great leaders uh, who are going to give you a firsthand account of what they've done and what they've learned. So as audience members, your role is to listen in for the first 20 minutes and um, think of some questions or some, uh, some thoughts or ideas that you may have. We, after the 20 minutes, we'll open it up to this larger panel and we'll ask your questions. So there's two ways for you to ask your question. The best way is if you just scroll at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. So press that and you can type in your question. Uh, also, in, there is a chat function. So do that through the chat, ask your questions or connect with others. Um, but uh, I'll be kind of collecting and prioritizing questions based on you know relevance and the flow of the conversation at the end. We only have one rule, which is the rule for our presenters as well, which is no sales pitches. It's the one thing that keeps this discovery session uh, open and free and exciting for a lot of people um, as a format. So we really uh, try and limit the number of, uh, of kind of direct sale pitch, sales pitches. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to pass it over to Levi Higgs from the Canada Green Building Council. He's gonna run us through a, a short presentation and then we'll jump right into the Q&A. So Levi, take it away. Great, uh, thanks for that, Corey. Um, you know, thanks for the opportunity uh, to present today on uh, C CAGBC's Disclosure Challenge Initiative. Um, you know, just a quick uh, thing for CAGBC. Uh, we are an industry association, um, you know, that we strive to kind of support the green of new and existing buildings. And uh, we're proud to be, uh, you know, taking part of uh, this great uh, Efficiency Canada's uh, outreach activities. Pleased today to be uh, joined by three of the five participants of, uh, of the initiative. And um, let's, uh, let's get to it. Here we go, full disclosure. Here are the topics I'll be looking to cover in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Starting off, anyone in the building industry knows the mantra, you know, you can't change what you don't measure. Benchmarking is a way that, uh, you know, buildings performance resource use can be, does, gets monitored and, uh, you know, um, compared internally, externally, between building types, helps us uh, set baselines, uh, helps uh, property managers, building owners diagnose performance, as well as it can inform public and uh, policy initiatives around, uh, you know, supporting um, efficiency as well as other, uh, other key, key building improvements. Uh, the Disclosure Challenge itself, a national uh, voluntary benchmarking disclosure initiative was launched in 2019 uh, with the support of uh, National Resources Canada, as well as uh, our partners. Um, you, you know, from a objective standpoint, you know, it was focused on demonstrating industry support for data transparency, showcasing the importance of uh, benchmarking disclosure when it comes to the development of retrofit economy, as well as looking to, to, um, looking to see about, you know, what are some of the key barriers and provide guidance uh, as jurisdictions are looking to develop, um, you know, national frameworks and, um, you know, their own benchmarking disclosure uh, programs. So yeah, I'm just not trying to skip ahead here. Program team consists of CGBC, which is a program lead, as well as Open Technologies, which helps support some of the technical aspects of the uh, program. Um, also happy to have five uh, real estate leaders um, that participated, including Quadreal, uh, Minto, Colliers, Trio Vest, and Concert Properties. Uh, from an overall perspective, you know, disclosure is an important step kind of in the, um, in the pathway towards really uh, supporting efficiency and uh, improvements as well as emissions reductions in our buildings, benchmarking being 
kind of the the first leg, you know, uh, from a building owner manager perspective, you know, disclosures that that next step where you're sharing that information internally, externally, um, you know, it helps to to then create labeling. Um, the, uh, provides the opportunity from a differentiation standpoint to to really push the importance of energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient buildings, which then can allow for uh, policy programs that that are looking to uh, really drive uh, performance improvements, uh, which is an important aspect uh, when it comes to our overall energy and emissions reductions activities in Canada. To get a sense of kind of the Canadian national context, uh, Ontario uh, is the only province that has an actual performance reporting requirement. Currently, there's no disclosure component of that. Uh, Alberta and the city of Edmonton has had a, a voluntary program within the city for the last three years. Um, that's been fairly successful. More, more recently, Nova Scotia, the city of Winnipeg, as well as British Columbia are, are um, putting together voluntary programs. Um, um, I will be ask, I'll calling on uh, the participants early here. Jamie, uh, maybe if you want to just provide a bit of an international lens, um, you know, how speak a little bit uh, about how Canada fits from an international perspective when it comes to benchmarking disclosure? Yeah, so we have an international portfolio as well, and um, we use third-party managers. So we've um, started, uh, two years ago, we started asking for property level uh, annual data. And um, so that's starting to flow in. What we see is that in the European marketplace and the Australian marketplace uh, and certain jurisdictions in the US, that this data is very easy to come by. And uh, we feel that's a competitive advantage. Um, those markets are able to have higher transparency, um, are able to achieve higher um, scores on uh, things that investors care about, the global real estate sustainability benchmark. And um, so that was part of the reason why we're supporting this in Canada, is we feel that a transparent marketplace uh, is good for investment. Moving on, uh, getting back to um, Canadian roots, uh, as part of the initiative, some key minimum profile and performance information was requested um, from our, our par participants. With contributions from our, our five, five key players, uh, we were able to collect uh, and publicly disclose information from over 700 buildings, representing 11 million uh, square feet of buildings, building space. The buildings were spread across the country with concentrations kind of in office and uh, multifamily res, as well as, as well as industrial and warehouse buildings. Ontario, Alberta, and BC being um, the majority of the buildings that were shared. The tools uh, that we utilized, um, Energy Star Portfolio Manager was uh, used as the data management kind of backbone and portal. Uh, we also took advantage of uh, the Seed Platform, which is a uh, open source software tool that allows large sets of data to be imported from multiple sources. And then it also provides a groundwork for <clears throat> an interactive uh, web-based um, portal. You know, I think one of the coolest things uh, that we developed was a, uh, a, a map that uh, you can um, you can utilize to um, look at buildings by type, uh, look at the different uh, participants, uh, look at the different regions. Um, I, I, Corey's going to crack the whip, so I can't go, I can't jump to it, but we'll uh, hopefully share a link and uh, you guys can uh, have a look at it in, uh, in your own time. Something that was evident in terms of uh, asking for information from uh, our participants with the buildings that they managed or owned is that, you know, there is, you know, uh, data opportunities and just, uh, you know, billing uh, realities. Uh, you know, we were only able to get uh, <clears throat> complete performance information from 320 buildings, so just over half, with some key building types being uh, fairly uh, challenge when it comes to providing uh, a full data set. For office and uh, multifamily res uh, buildings, we were able to get uh, full data for uh, a fairly large um, portion of the buildings that we had, which allowed us to sort of have a bit of a deeper look in terms of the um, the, the findings. Um, some of the key uh, interesting findings we, we found was that, you know, for office buildings, there was about uh, 10% more uh, energy efficient than the national average, whereas for the multi-residential buildings uh, shared in the challenge, uh, they're about 20% less efficient. Uh, obvious differences when it comes to the GHG intensity by region with um, you know, electric electricity grids playing a big part in, 
and how um, uh, GHG intensive the buildings were. Um, there was a split fairly evenly for post and pre-1990 buildings for office and multifamily res. Um, for office buildings, it was evident that the pre and post-1990 buildings, uh, post-1990 buildings were about 10% efficient, more efficient than pre-1990, whereas um, multifamily residence buildings, there wasn't much of a change between 1990 and uh, pre and post-1990 when it comes to site uh, uh, energy use intensity. One other key uh, point I'll mention here, when it comes to passive uh, house uh, standards, which is around 100 kilowatt hours um, of, of site use intensity, you know, you'll notice the difference from a, a mean standpoint would be about 61% improvement for office buildings that would be required to get to that level and for multifamily residents, it would, it would be around a 65% uh, uh, performance improvement requirement uh, just to provide that, uh, that context. As part of the program, um, you know, in, cons in consultation with, uh, with our participants, um, you know, a final report was drafted, uh, included information on key lessons learned and, and recommendations for industry and governments to consider. Um, you know, some of the lessons learned is, 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 uh, is you know, fairly, uh, fairly evident when it comes to uh, looking at a large data set and, and trying to figure out like, you know, what is a building? You know, I mean, is a building an address? Is it a combination of addresses? Does it represent a complex? Is it, you know, is it just maybe a couple floors? So really being able to under, understand, you know, how do we define, you know, what we're looking at when it comes to a site uh, is fairly crucial. Um, you know, details matter. So, you know, knowing whether or not we got one meter or four meters for a building, um, you know, making sure that the data is representative and, and uh, accurate is, is also something that uh, takes time and resources. In, in Canada, we have uh, different metrics as well as gross floor versus gross lease area. So those things play a part when it comes to data accuracy. Uh, other keys were around utility connections when it comes to billing. So wherever uh, jurisdictions had a <clears throat> utility that had direct connections between uh, billing data and Energy Star Portfolio Manager, the ability to uh, to pull that data and, and and get that data into um, into the, the challenge was was uh, much more easily available. We say you know the less connection, the less sort of people involved, the better when it comes to maybe the billing connect data connection. That's key, but also people do make a difference. You know you need to write you need to have people on both sides of uh, of the ledger, uh, one on the billing owner manager side as well as uh, that data reconciliation side to make make sure that uh, you know the data coming in is is reconciled and as accurate as possible. Uh, and another key would be around tenant. Uh, and owner privacy concern when it comes to um, data sharing and publicly disclosure. Final recommendations were also uh, included. Um, you know, we really looked at this as an opportunity to work with industry, uh, real estate industry partners, um, you know, get down to some of those details around, you know, if jurisdictions are looking to put together uh, a, uh, benchmarking disclosure requirements within their jurisdiction. What are some of the challenges, and what are some of the ways that we can reduce the the pain that would be that's involved? Uh, and so, some of the uh, recommendations that were uh, agreed to and and arrived at were around standardization. You know, the more standard the data that's collected and how it's collected, uh, um, the the better, and and the the overall burden that it's uh, that's reduced for uh, real estate um, real estate organizations. Don't reinvent the wheel. Energy Star Portfolio Manager is utilized uh, across Canada, you know, across across the world when it comes to, uh, a, you know, a, a data man, maybe not across the world, I guess, but North America. And anyways, uh, you know, it is there. Uh, it's well supported from a, a data portal standpoint. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it's very useful uh, when um, when used properly. Uh, you know, standardizing the minimum data collected uh, is also another key we, we touched on, as well as, you know, really enabling that differentiation to happen. So, you know, for, for you know, having uh, real estate leaders, uh, real estate owners, managers, being able to 
to have their buildings recognized for energy efficiency and really driving that kind of market opportunity when it comes to uh, publicly sharing and 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 um, uh, showcasing the importance uh, and of uh, energy efficient buildings and and uh, you know th there's there's opportunity when it comes to certification labeling uh, as well as uh, other um, pathways uh, for that uh, recognition piece so those are some of the keys um, picking on a, a participant again um, you know Nikki maybe uh, you can touch on maybe what recommendation Collier's uh, you know uh, resonated uh, most most uh, resident most with yeah, thanks, Leo. Um, so Colliers, we're, we're a third party building um, manager. We don't own our buildings, but we manage on behalf of our clients. And we have a portfolio of over 900 buildings across Canada. Um, I, we supported all the recommendations, but I guess the one that really stood out for us was standardizing that data that's collected and really supporting how, um, how it's uploaded. And as, as Levi mentioned, some jurisdictions, so in, in BC and Manitoba, uh, there is some automatic data upload capacity from the utilities, which is really helpful. In, in other areas, there isn't. And with the, the volume of buildings that we manage and the, the number of accounts, so I think we have, we have thousands of utility accounts that we track. And where, um, where the utilities have the capacity to upload that information and um, at least uh, check it and upload it into energy star that that's huge for our clients so that was that was one thing that sort of specifically resonated with us great thanks for that nikki i'm sure there'll be questions coming soon so um there'll be some more 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 digging maybe in, in terms of the recommendations uh, happy to say uh, we are uh, still rolling. Disclosure Challenge 2020 is uh, is is uh, you know underway, and and we're looking to continue to demonstrate the industry support for uh, data transparency. Um, you know, showcase its importance when it comes to retrofit economy, as well as recognize you know the participants and owners and managers for uh, for their you know responsible management and, and sharing of data. Um, and then we are looking to update uh, our report findings and and take another little dive into the data to see uh, see what it's telling us. Uh, some of the benefits uh, for the initiative uh, and participants is around uh, that technical support and data reconciliation standpoint when it comes to sharing portfolio, uh, their portfolio information, um, you know, further benchmarking opportunities uh, across across the country, as well as uh, public recognition. So uh, no sales pitches, we're a nonprofit. So <laughs> this is all, it's all free. If anyone was interested in terms of on, that's uh, on the call uh, from a building owner or manager's perspective, but if uh, you are uh, in Canada and have buildings and, and are interested in uh, you know, uh, participating in the challenge, um, please uh, send me an email, let me know. Uh, yeah, let me know, uh, provide some details. Um, you know, we are looking to bring in, um, uh, bring in building portfolio and, uh, and information from, from 2019, um, sort of by the end of the year, and then we'll be looking to update uh, our reporting and, and, and um, publicize participants in, in early 2021. I'm, I'm happy to say that, uh, that, that all three participants that are on the phone have agreed to go through the this trials and tribulations of another round of, of, uh, of, of sharing, as, as well as uh, Trio Vest and Concert Properties, and we've also added um, Brookfield uh, properties and, and Kingset Capital in Canada as well. So we're up to seven and we're looking to expand. So uh, let me know if, uh, if, if uh, yeah, let me know if anyone's interested and has any more questions on that. I think that's time. So um, uh, maybe a quick question, Corey, do you want me to stick on this slide or, or, or one after? Sure. I'm sure I'm assuming that I just keep sharing my screen. Is that correct? Yeah, keep it on this one so people know, uh, you know, uh, how each of our panelists is connected to which company. But um, thank you for that, Levi. And I really appreciate uh, CAGBC's leadership on this. Sometimes, you know, in the, when there's lack of a, a policy instrument kind of pushing forward, the uh, it's just great to see people just jumping in and doing it and proving the value in case and being the the kind of the early movers on it, um, which essentially creates the certainty for policymakers sometimes that, you know, these are, this is how to design a policy. This is, you know, 
the sky didn't fall when we didn't when when this was done voluntarily and uh, and and making sure that there's support networks to support people who you know to participate in a in a mandatory uh, policy. So congrats to to CAGBC, but also to uh, our panelists who who decided to jump in full force and and were okay with that. Um, so that's actually my first question. And and again, a notice to anyone listening, please feel free to. Uh, jump into the Q&A and then write up some questions. I see some coming already um, and uh, type up your question and I'll, I'll kind of uh, ask them of the panelists. But maybe I thought uh, we could start with uh, Joanna and then we'll go to Nikki and then Jamie. I'm curious, like unvarnished, just tell me, you know, what was it like having to do all this? <laughs> you know, there may be some uh, commercial real estate folks on here or implementers who work with them. Just tell us like, was it hard? Was it difficult to get this data? Did you have to wrangle other people in the company? Like, just tell us, like, tell us what it's like to actually have to do it. Uh, sure. Thanks, Corey. Um, so Minto is mainly focused on uh, multi-use residential or multi-unit residential buildings. Um, and uh, initially, when we went to our senior management with the idea, there were definitely a lot of questions around what the data was going to be used for um, and how we thought that that would uh, reflect on Minto. Uh, but after discussing it and sort of going through what's being done in the industry right now and uh, the lack of data that there is really with regards to MERBs, we realized that there were just, there were so many benefits in participating in the disclosure challenge um, versus the risks um, that uh, we agreed to, to proceed. Um, in terms of getting the data uh, uploaded, uh, I mean, Energy Star Portfolio Manager has been used many years um, in many different ways. So there is a little bit of a learning curve in getting your different buildings set up and learning how to upload the different information. But but once you get over that hurdle, it's, it's relatively straightforward. There's a lot of um, internal sort of checks in place. So if it sees that some of the the data overlaps or something like that, you get you get flagged to that. So so the actual process of uploading the data into Energy Star Portfolio Manager is a bit time consuming, but they really have made the process uh, as painless as possible. Um, I think the big challenges uh, that I found with regards to uploading the data was uh, realizing the difference sort of between our buildings where we have whole building data versus just, uh, especially on the electricity side, just the common area. So we do have some buildings where uh, the suites are directly metered to the local, local utility. Um, and in those cases, uh, unfortunately, for the most part, uh, Minto is unable to, to get that information. So uh, Levi had already identified that sort of as one of the takeaways in, in trying to figure out how can we uh, improve the process so that we have for all buildings, the whole building data and can really do an, an apple to apple comparison across the chart. Great, thanks Joanna. Nikki? Um, yeah, thanks Corey. Uh, so we we already within Colliers, we, we try and or we do benchmark internally within our portfolio. So not all our buildings, but most of the key buildings. Um, we, we manage commercial real estate, so it's primarily offices, retail, and light industrial. So we, within colleagues, we're already using Energy Star on, on a, a large number of our buildings, I would say. So that part was already, you know, kind of established. Um, so, so making that information or being part of the Disclosure challenge was was the kind of logical next step, and I think most people in the industry realise that benchmarking is coming. Um, you know, whether you like it or not, it's it's something um, Jamie mentioned earlier. It's happening in other parts of the world. It's not particularly a new thing. It's it's maybe new in in Canada, moving towards labelling, but it's it, the concept is not a new concept. So I think most people realise it's coming. Um, we're already doing it internally, so that part was was not such a challenge actually collating the data and having meaningful data is is a challenge and those are some of the things that Levi touched on and some of the recommendations so um, just building on what what Joanna said so we, for example we manage quite a lot of light industrial or 
um, strip mall retail type units. And often we maybe have responsibility for house meters, so we'll have some data there, but the tenants might pay directly for a number of their own meters. And it can be really mixed up. It might be maybe they just pay electricity and we pay all the house gas. Um, maybe they have a gas meter as well. And collecting that type of data for a building to get a meaningful whole building number is a challenge. And I think in a, in a way, just going through the steps of participating really emphasized why we need a more coherent and national approach because uh, as, as Levi would tell you, when the data came through, like not, not all of it did relate to whole buildings. So it, it was a bit of a patchwork and not all the data was, um, was meaningful and was able to generate energy star scores, which is something we've been struggling with since we started benchmarking. So, Amy, yeah, anything? Yeah, Sorry. thanks for that, Nikki. So in a way, some of it is if you're already doing it, it's easy. And but then, you know, there's definitely some challenges on the way. Jamie, is that is that kind of what you, what you saw too? Or, or from your team? Did they kind of have similar challenges? Or was it smooth sailing all the way through? Yeah, for 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 me, it was easy. We, um, we already had energy star accounts for all, all of our properties, uh, have an energy analyst. Uh, so very fortunate. Uh, to have the resources to uh, for it to be smooth sailing on our on our side, uh, I think the the reason why we're members is we see such value <clears throat> in benchmarking and disclosure. Um, we think the whole industry should do it, and it, you know we find it to be a very profitable thing. We the more we know about our energy data, the more we manage it, uh, the better we are at um, driving savings for our tenants, and uh, that's what we're about. Um, so. There's an upfront um, time cost expenditure, uh, but it's extremely uh, worth it. Cool. Levi, I'm wondering if you can go back to the slide that talked about the percentage of, of data that you were able to get by building type. One of the questions on, on the chat uh, from Matthew was how hard it was to get the building data in BC. So maybe that, uh, that will help answer that. But related to that, uh, from a data question, um, uh, maybe Levi can just answer yes or no. Is the data available on the type of energy source, but also on the final energy usage, like heating and lighting? And you know, do, do we have it down to that granular level? Uh, so yeah, short answer for this challenge, no, uh, not to the end use type, um, but there is, uh, yeah, so there's information on, on the site use intensity as well as uh, GHG emissions intensity for the buildings that had performance data and that can all be kind of played around with on the, um, on the web tool. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, question from Nick Schroeder from the ISO. Maybe Joanna, you can answer or, or pass to someone who can, but um, participating in the disclosure challenge and getting that kind of data you know, back, has that facilitated easier participation in, let's say, programs from BC Hydro or Fortis BC? Um, we don't have any buildings in BC, so uh, maybe I'll uh, throw yeah, that Yeah, actually the question Nikki. wasn't in BC, so. Was, oh, okay. Yeah, but I was just using as an example. But just a, a, across any provincial energy efficiency program, having this data, are you able to now participate easier in those types of programs? Um, I wouldn't say that there's been a direct connection between uh, Disclosure Challenge and other um, provincial programs. Um, in Ontario, there's the EWRB program, which we, we have to do. Um, but uh, it's definitely made our senior management more open to looking at these, these types of programs um, and be willing to, to participate in, in different things. Uh, we're taking a look at, at some of the different programs that are offered um, in different regions and, and considering. So I think having gone through this hurdle makes the discussions about participating in other programs a lot easier to do. Um, and the uh, all the information that we were able to gather and talking within the, the company about the, the value of, of benchmarking and, and seeing how the industry is doing as a whole and how we can work with our peers to try to continually improve um, has really made a huge difference in uh, senior management being open to, to other initiatives. That's great. Jamie, I think or I'd, Nikki? I'd, I'd yeah. just to add that, um, you know, they're Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, 
um, have recently announced uh, voluntary energy benchmarking that's going to, I believe, turn into mandatory. And um, we're just able to, you know, very quickly uh, sign up for those things. And so there's, um, we don't have to expend a lot of uh, regional team effort to do so. Uh, and, um, and then uh, arrange those programs, offer uh, some incentives. So in Edmonton, it was sort of subsidies on uh, energy audits and a range of things. So uh, being able to participate uh, opened up uh, other opportunities that municipalities uh, were offering. And then, um, yeah, on the utility incentive programs, uh, having strong data uh, so that you can do basic uh, m and um, makes it lowers the bar for, to entry for our buildings uh, to, to participate in um, in those utility programs. Right. Nikki, any, anything to add from your end? Yeah, um, just to, to build on that a little bit. Um, so I, I think part, part of the one, one of the benefits from participating in the challenge was it, it brought the conversation um, at a more senior level within our organization around energy, around efficiency, uh, which is always a good thing. Um, and we have found definitely that the, the benchmarking programs, whether we're doing it internally benchmarking or in these types of disclosure challenges, it does act as a, as a kind of competition. You know, people want to see what, what building, what score does my building have? Where does it sit? Where's everyone else's, you know, internally, externally, whatever. And that in itself is part of the process of driving um, improve, improving performance. So although there's not necessarily a correlation with um, local utility incentives, apart from, you know, in, in some jurisdictions where they, they have connected it, um, I've definitely found that there's been more of a conversation around efficiency, uh, property managers and, and the, even down to the building operators, they want to see their building improve, they want to see their scores go up. And so when you when we start looking at incentive programs, there's definitely more interest and more um, traction, you know, people that they're, there's they're looking at well, what can we do in our building, can we change the lights, can we do something with the HVAC, is there an incentive. And uh, yeah, that whole competitive element was a kind of um, I guess slightly unforeseen um, piece on the side, but it's been really helpful in, in improving performance of the buildings. And engage, helping engage everybody from sort of more senior level down to the building operators that it's just sparked some more interest. Nobody wants to see building has a great score. <laughs> So I wanted to touch on, it was a question here, but it's kind of a broader question. Maybe Levi, you can kick us off and, um, and others can chime in. Um, certainly when, um, you know, there is a move towards baking this in as official policy and having this as a mandatory uh, tool for governments, oftentimes the greatest strength that the governments can provide on this is additional support. And so one of the great things about this program is it had this kind of wraparound support but not every company has a superstar like you three. <laughs> so I'm just curious kind of like how you see the levels of support from uh, either, you know, CAGBC through this program or a government program, if it is announced, um, you know, things like training on how to use Energy Star Portfolio Manager or other kinds of just general wraparound support that you think are absolutely required if this was going to move from a voluntary to a mandatory uh, policy. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great point. And, um, you know, as, as you look to uh, bring information in from multiple sources and then provide, um, you know, publicly disclose information, you know, to ensure that you're doing it in an accurate and kind of well-founded way, there definitely needs to be resources that is not only on the building owner side, but also on sort of the, that data management um, you know, like organization jurisdiction side of things. And so, uh, you know, whether or not it's a, uh, you know, whether or not it's a, you know, one-stop shop benchmarking portal that the governments uh, come up with where you can find information on, you know, how to better understand Energy Star, Energy Star Portfolio Manager or how you connect uh, your BCA and BC, your BC Hydro account to Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Um, you know, I think that is a key piece that jurisdictions uh, will need to consider uh, when implementing, uh, you know, maybe a broader voluntary or even uh, mandatory requirements because um, it's the only way that you're going to uh, help enable smaller building owners or, um, you know, uh, real estate 
uh, organizations with buildings across the country to really um, effectively bring their information uh, forward and then and then make sure that it's accurate because um, there are uh, some typical challenges when it comes to um, you know having only the common use area um, shown from an electrical standpoint or um, you know, building types are maybe listed as industrial when, you know, they're really, there's some warehouses, like, the, you know, there's sort of some, some reconciliation that definitely has to, definitely has to happen and support uh, is, uh, is needed um, to be included as part of any kind of program development, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. And related to that, to the data, there's a question around, um, like, because you just mentioned that you can connect through Energy Star Portfolio Manager, connect directly to your utility um, uh, account. But because of privacy, that utilities don't provide aggregated data to the public. But if you have a building, you can connect it directly to your data usage from your utility, making that data collection easier, right? Yeah, the, in, in different uh, jurisdictions, utility uh, allow for uh, a, a direct data connection from your billing. So Hydro and Fortis have, have them in, uh, in, in BC, as well as Manitoba Hydro. Ontario, you guys got like hundreds and hundreds of utilities, so so I think it's probably a bit more uh, <laughs> spotty. But uh, uh, you know, having that data direct data connection allows that first step to be fairly seamless. The opportunity to share your data then becomes much much easier. So you can send a link, you can share it with you know with organizations such as CHVC or uh, other uh, you know other jurisdictions that are looking to kind of you know uh, have a look at the. Uh, at the information, so so that upper, once that sort of first step is passed around having that uh, billing data directly inputted into Energy Star Portfolio Manager, the next steps uh, become a bit a bit easier to to manage for sure. Uh, a couple of comments. One one you know, building on what Levi said, the different utilities have different rules around when the landlord can uh, access the data from its tenants. So I believe in BC, if you have a multi-use building, uh, multi-tenant building, if there are 20 uh, accounts or more in that building, then the landlord can get access to it. Um, and it doesn't name the accounts, it just sort of aggregates it. Uh, other utilities, I think, have different number of tenant, number of utility accounts in a building, uh, minimum number before the landlord is given access to it. Um, the process of requesting it um, is pretty cumbersome. Uh, every utility is different and they typically um, struggle to uh, respond. Uh, I believe um, in, uh, in Ontario, the green button um, connect my data is now be becoming a requirement of utility companies. Um, I, I forget the timeline. But I think that will be a, a big step forward. Uh, in relation to the prior question, yeah, I think um, there are a couple of interesting opportunities. The, the, the first is, uh, you know, some utility companies have great incentives to hire an energy manager, and that's fantastic. Uh, I think a lot of smaller companies, uh, even then, they, they can't afford it. They don't have the scale to need a full-time energy manager. Uh, and so some form of incentive um, to um, bring, some, bring a consultant in to at least uh, get utility accounts connected, get Energy Star accounts set up, get to the spot of uh, benchmarking uh, would be very valuable. Cool. So we'd like to try and wrap up at 1245 and make sure people have uh, some space to get to their next thing. So I do want to kind of wrap up with one question that Christy Dyer asked, and I'm going to kind of expand on it a little bit. But Christy's um, question for you extraordinary people is how, what does this all mean to the ordinary person? And so maybe we could step back at a higher level. You guys participated in this challenge. You're big, you know, evangelists for this type of thing. What, how does this matter in the context of Canada's, you know, climate policy, energy efficiency policy? How does this matter to the, the average Canadian or to people who are um, living and working in buildings um, maybe just step back for a minute and just take 30 seconds to tell us why this matters um, to the average person. Maybe I'll start. Um, you know, I think that information is sometimes looked upon as good and bad and publicly disclosing it. People see it as like it's going to be used and for, for bad, I guess you could say. But really, you know, information is 
in this context is neither good nor bad. It, it really, what it does is it helps to, to uh, better differentiate where efficiencies are happening, which then enables, you know, us to sort of focus on how do we bring our buildings up to more efficient levels and how do we support organizations and people making the best choices possible when it comes to the, uh, you know, living in an energy efficient building, uh, working in an energy efficient building and, uh, you know, organizations improving efficiency as well as emissions reduction. So uh, information in this context really allows us to sort of make better choices and make better investments for both public, uh, you know, the ordinary citizen as well as uh, I think, uh, I think larger organizations. Nikki, why don't you? Uh, yeah, so just quickly, um, I guess just inherently benchmarking in itself, we see continuous improvement. So it drives performance. And like Levi said, it enables us to look at the best performing buildings and, and learn from those and take some of the, the lessons and practices and apply those to the poorer performing buildings. And so it, it improves efficiency overall, which is, you know, all drives into the, the lowering of greenhouse gases and helps to align with the, the sort of the federal and the international climate goals. I guess one of the things that, that Nikki touched on was sort of the, the competition that sometimes happens once you start showing your staff these, uh, these numbers. Uh, we've also seen that having multiple years of data and being able to track how your building is is performing year to year is uh, quite motivating for uh, different groups of people. Because um, a lot of times, uh, sort of in the day in, day out, you can forget that the actions that you're doing add up to a big effect. So, so being able to see that all the work that you're putting into adds up to, you know, a 5% energy reduction year to year or a 2% water reduction or something like that. Um, so being able to see all of the efforts that you do on an everyday basis uh, come into a number that, you know, you can you can plot on a chart and you can see how the progress is, uh, is, is really helpful. Um, and, uh, and just from a, like an everyday public, um, it, having this information out there really allows people to make informed decisions about where where they're going to invest their money or spend their money so it it just gives everybody more information and, and you're able to make uh decisions about about who you're going to support great jamie uh with good data and with alignment within our company uh we're confident we'll get to 80 percent carbon reduction ahead of 2050 I think for Canada to do the same, uh, it needs good data uh, for all buildings so it can design uh, efficient policies and um, building energy benchmarking disclosure is a necessary uh, condition um, to, to achieve that. It's not sufficient, but it's a necessary um, stepping stone to get to the types of retrofit policies uh, that will get Canada to its uh, carbon target. Which is what we all want. So um, good good segue to the conclusion. So thank you all. Uh, Levi, thank you for walking us through and for leading the Disclosure Challenge in Canada. Um, if you just want to quickly go to that screen that has your email address on it so people can see. And if uh, for those that I wasn't able to get to uh, questions, please uh, connect directly with Levi. Uh, Nikki, Jamie, Joanna, thank you so much for lending your time and for being the uh, the great um, you know experimenters uh, and trailblazers on this process. Um, I think you are doing that heavy lifting that a lot of people will eventually be benefiting from. So thanks for your leadership. Um, so that concludes uh, this week's session. Um, we do record these and we will be posting it on our website and send out a note to each of you. So um, uh, you will see that. So if you do have colleagues, friends um, all over um, that you think would be interested in it, we could, uh, you could send them the link. Uh, next week, we're back again, same, same time. Uh, next Friday, uh, our host um, or our presenter is Brent Copperson from the Windfall Ecology Center. And actually, he's going to be talking about something very similar about making data accessible for science-based policies. So again, playing on the theme of data, how important it is 
uh, that we, uh, we make sure we're investing in collecting data so that Canada can meet its climate commitments and the world on the path to maintaining 1.5 degrees. So thank you all again. Have an amazing day. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.